the Beach Fellowship. Um, we're thrilled that uh, you've chosen to worship with us this morning. I talked to a few people, and uh, it seems like there's a few visitors this morning. So for the sake of those who are visiting, I'll, I'll just make sure I rehearse some of our pertinent details about our church. We are the Beach Fellowship. We meet six months out of the year, roughly on the beach. Six months out of the year, we rent the Christian Conference Center, which is uh, behind the playground in town. Uh, there's a little chapel out front that's not our deal. We're in the back in the octagonal building. And we meet there during the winter time. And also, if the weather turns really ugly this summer, we have that as a backup. So we'll use that. But um, we've been meeting on the beach now for over 16 years, I think, if my math's right. And uh, uh, we could move in, inland, but uh, we feel that God has called us here to the beach. And so for six years, this is the best site, as long as the weather holds, uh, six, six months of the year, and then we meet indoors during the other time. Um, we're thankful that you're here. On the back table is some uh, cards with our church information right in front of the offering box there. We urge you to take some cards, brought some extras this morning. Pass them out to your friends and neighbors, and leave them on the uh, leave them at the condo you're staying at, maybe on a on the bulletin board or whatever. But uh, help us spread the word about our church, and uh, also you can find out uh, you can follow along with our services there from our website. Uh, we publish our, we we post our uh, both an audio and a uh, audio and video and a. Uh, a written copy of our Sunday messages on our website so you can keep up with that if you want to and uh, also my home address is there which uh, is important because on Wednesday night we have a what we're calling bonfire Bible studies at my house um, we're meeting outside and uh, we're right now we're going through the book of Esther Esther is starting to get exciting right now so you're if you come this week it'd be a great time to come but uh, we study the Bible there on Wednesday night, and I also have a time of fellowship and so forth around a bonfire. So it's nice to be able to do that. My address is on the card. It should get you there. Um, the only other announcement is the women do a monthly prayer walk, uh, and it's coming up on July 3rd. It'll be at 9 a.m., and uh, the ladies are going to be meeting here in the parking lot on July 3rd. That's a Saturday morning at 9 o'clock and uh, they'll walk on the beach for about 30 minutes in prayer and so forth together and they do that once a month you're welcome to participate in that if you have questions about it see my wife uh, Susie and uh, they'd love to meet you that's going to be when uh, Saturday morning July 3rd in the parking lot okay that's all the announcements I'm going to do unless I think of something else I've forgotten but I think that should be it let's uh, go to the Lord in prayer this morning Father in heaven, we thank you for your promise to never leave us nor forsake us, to always be with us. We thank you for the promise of eternal life. We thank you for the gift of salvation, the gift of righteousness that none of us could earn, none of us deserve, but was transferred to us from Jesus Christ through faith in him. Lord, we pray that you would meet with us this morning. We came to worship you, to have fellowship with you, to learn from you, to hear from you. So Lord, I pray that we would do that, that you would meet with us, that you would speak with us. People might know this morning that they were in the presence of the Lord. We thank you for the beautiful weather. We thank you for the freedoms that we enjoy, that we're able to meet in public without fear of persecution. We just ask you now to be with our time together, that you would bless it and bless these people. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to sing, How Great Thou Art. And uh, we should be able to find that in your songbook, How Great Thou Art.
Turn over to Be Still My Soul.
shall meet at last. All right, thank you. You may be seated. <coughs> Rusty's going to come up and read our psalm for today. It's Psalm 139. Good morning, church. You see, when I come up, I have to move the microphone. If we had uh, nicknames, Pastor Roy would be longboard, I'd be shortboard. <laughs> Psalm 139, God's omnipresence and omnis omniscience. O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou dost know when I sit down and when I rise up. Thou dost understand my thoughts from afar. Thou dost scrutinize my path and my lying down. You are intimately acquainted with all my ways. Even before there is a word on my tongue, behold, O Lord, thou dost know it all. Thou hast enclosed me behind and before me and laid thy hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful to, for me it's too high for me, I cannot attain to it. Where can I go from thy spirit? Where can I flee from thy presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Seol, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the dawn, if I dwell in the remotest part of the sea, even there thy hand will lead me. Thy right hand will lay hold of me. If I say, surely the darkness will overwhelm me and the light around me will be like night, even the darkness is not dark to thee and the night is as bright as the day to thee. Darkness and light are alike to thee. For thou didst form my inward parts, thou didst weave me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to thee for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are thy works, Lord, and my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from thee. When I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the depths of the earth, thine eyes had seen my unformed substance. And in thy book they were all written, the days that were ordained for me, when as yet there was not one of them yet to come. How precious are also are thy thoughts to me, O God! How vast is the sum of them! If I should count them, they would outnumber the sand. When I awake, I am still with thee. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me, O God, and know my anxious thoughts. And see if there be any sinful way in me, and lead me in the everlasting way. Will you join me in prayer this morning? Heavenly Father, you're our sustainer and our provider. You give us numerous blessings beyond number on a daily basis, and so many of them go unnoticed by us. In this unusual season, as it continues, we are sincerely repentant of our many sins. We humbly ask your forgiveness for those sins. We anxiously ask you to awaken us to your words and your deeds. Deliver us from all deception. Heavenly Father, make us strong and courageous so that we can boldly proclaim your words and your deeds in Christ-like patience and truth. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
turn your Bibles this morning to 1 John chapter 2. 1 Most of you know, we go through the Bible verse by verse, chapter by chapter. We're today in 1 John chapter 2, by the providence of God. We believe that God has a special message for us this morning. First John chapter 2, starting in verse 25. This is the promise which he himself made to us, eternal life. These things I have written to you concerning those who are trying to deceive you. As for you, the anointing which you receive from him abides in you, and you have no need for anyone to teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about all things and is true and is not a lie, just as it has taught you, you abide in him. Now, little children, abide in him, so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink away from shame at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone also who practices righteousness is born of him. Lord, as John just indicated here, I pray through the anointing of the Holy Spirit that you would open our hearts and minds to receive the word as the seed is planted in our hearts that it might spring up into everlasting life and bear forth fruit. We ask this in Jesus' name. John is writing to the Christians in the churches because false doctrine had crept into the church and was deceiving many. He says that in verse 26, these things I've written to you concerning those who are trying to deceive you. The false doctrine was especially perpetrated on the church by what was eventually called Gnosticism, which means knowledge. They professed that there was a special knowledge, a secret knowledge of spiritual things, which they wanted to teach the church. But John says it's false knowledge. And so he calls them false prophets. In fact, in verse 18, he calls them Antichrist. He says in verse 18, children, it is the last hour. And just as you heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now, many Antichrists have appeared. From this, we know that it is the last hour. Now, John is concerned that the church be able to distinguish between the word of truth and the lie of the Antichrist and false prophets. He's concerned because the deception at its worst will keep people from being saved and at its best will keep the saved from spiritual maturity. And so he's been showing us various tests by which we are able to discern the truth from the lie and those that are saved from those that are not saved, but in reality are really agents of Satan to deceive the church. You know, we no longer have Gnosticism today. But we have the same old lies packaged under a different wrapping paper, which is being foisted upon the church in our age. Satan's tactics are still the same as they ever were. Jesus said he is a liar and the father of lies. He just repackages the same old lie. Another way that John has shown the difference between the true gospel and the false gospel is his frequent use of contrast. He contrasts, for instance, light and darkness, the truth and the lie, righteousness and sin. And as we now enter this next section, John gives us another contrast. He gives us the contrast between the promise of Christ and the false promise of the Antichrist and the false prophets. And I urge you now, as you consider this, to, to really kind of put aside this left behind theology that uh, dominates our, our, our eschatology uh, understanding today in so many uh, situations. I'm not here to debate uh, 
the pros and cons of that particular view of eschatology. I happen not to hold to it. Uh, I believe that the uh, book of Revelation in particular is a book of symbols, and uh, it's not to be taken chronologically and literally, but it's a book of symbols. It doesn't mean that things aren't going to happen, but it means that they're not going to perhaps look exactly as they're portrayed. But um, according to the context in which John is talking about um, these antichrists saying they're already in his day at work in the world, I would encourage you to think of antichrist and false prophets as the emissaries of Satan's strategy that was in effect since the first century until now, which is to deceive and distort the truth and to lead people into a false religion by the, by the use of false prophets, which intends to overthrow God's plan of redemption for the world. So John intends to show a contrast between the truth and the deception so that we can be discerning and know the truth. He begins this contrast by saying in verse 25, this is the promise which he himself made to us, eternal life. So the first point in this section is what John calls the promise. Promise. To determine, you know, if someone is lying to you, you first have to know what they said. John says that Jesus made a promise to us. That's what the gospel is, isn't it, in a nutshell? A promise from God. A promise of life. John says it's a promise of eternal life. Eternal life is not just a quantity of life. It's a quality of life. That's an important distinction. Eternal life is not just a long, long, long time. It's spiritual life. It's abundant life. It's life in the presence of God, in fellowship with God. It's life as God intended it to be at creation. Now, I believe that John is speaking of Jesus Christ making that promise of eternal life. But as you know, the scripture teaches that Jesus and the Father and the Spirit are one. But it's interesting to see when this promise was made. It wasn't made for the first time during Christ's ministry. It wasn't even made at creation. It was made at some point in eternity past. Paul says in Titus 1.1, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledging of the truth, which is after godliness, in hope of eternal life, which God, that cannot lie, promised before the world began. So Paul says God promised eternal life before the world even began. God's plan from eternity past was to create a human race which would be the bride of Christ, which would be body, soul, and spirit, and which would be like them in that they would live forever with him and love him and serve him. So it says in Genesis 2, 7 that God breathed into the nostrils of man the breath of life and man became a living soul. But as man sinned, and sin entered the world. That life with God died. The spirit of man died. And man ceased to live in fellowship with God, but was doomed to eternal separation from God, which the Bible calls spiritual death. But the plan of God, which was established before creation, did not come to an end at that, po at that point. Because the plan of God had planned for man's sin as well. And the plan was to send Jesus Christ to earth to become a man, to become man's substitute, so that they might be given life, even eternal life, and be restored to fellowship with God. So Jesus, when he began his ministry, came to fulfill that promise and give eternal life to those that believed in him. He gave us the promise of life. And all that he taught and all that he did was the basis of that promise. It was to help us understand that promise, to be able to comprehend that promise, so that we might believe it and be saved from death. Jesus came for one purpose, to give life 
to those who had the condemnation of death. He didn't come to create a social utopia on earth. He didn't come to heal the sick and eradicate disease. He didn't come to build a financial empire or to give us the great scientific advancements. He came to give eternal life to those who were dying, to the people he created, whom he created for his pleasure, to have fellowship with him, to be his eternal bride, but who by their choice of sin had rejected him and received in themselves the penalty of death. Because he still loved them, he came to give them life, that they that believe in him might be with him forever. For God so loved the world, John 3.16 tells us, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's the promise. But in order to do that, Jesus had to fulfill the justice of God. So he had to take the place of sinners and die in their place. He became our substitute so that he might be our Savior. And so he died on the cross, suffering the punishments which we deserved, so that he might, we might be given life. This is the promise of eternal life. This is the gospel. It's the promise that Jesus made. It is the truth that will set you free. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. Jesus said in John 10, 10, he said, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they might have life and they might have it more abundantly. You know, Jesus isn't just talking about this so-called abundant life that you see on Christian television. He's talking about spiritual life, which is life with God, which is fellowship with God, which is everlasting life. But notice, in that quote I just gave of Jesus in John 10.10, 10, Jesus includes in his promise to give eternal life, he includes a warning. He gives a contrast between the promise of life and the lie which results in death. His warning is that there is a thief who comes to steal, steal and kill and destroy. That's the deceiver who John says whose spirit is already at work in the world, the Antichrist. And John follows the same pattern of Jesus now and contrasts the promise of life with the deception that leads to death. So in contrast to the promise is the deception. Notice verse 26. These things I've written to you concerning those who are trying to deceive you. You know, last week, in the previous section, we talked a lot about the deception. John speaks of the Antichrist already being at work in the world. Later on in the epistle, he will speak of false prophets and deceiving spirits. He speaks of our need to test the spirit, to see whether they are from God. As I said last week, the way we test the spirits is by the word of God. There is no other reliable test. We can't test the spirits by whether or not they can work miracles. That's a common mistake today. Jesus said in Matthew 24, 24, for false Christ and false prophets will arise and will show great signs and wonders so as to mislead, if possible, even the elect. So you can't tell who they are by their miracle powers. Remember when Moses appeared before Pharaoh and he performed signs and wonders. Remember the false prophets there, the, the uh, wise men of Pharaoh, performed many of the same miracles. So we can't judge by miracles or by some power that they seem to have. The only reliable test is the Word of God. Now the Antichrist is quite simply defined as those who are in opposition to Christ. They may not appear to be in opposition to Christ. In fact, they may even claim to know Christ. They may even claim to be an emissary of Christ, a, a prophet of Christ. But their opposition is revealed by the fact that they lie. 
they distort the truth, they twist the truth, and in some cases they outright deny the truth. Their purpose is to steal, to kill, and destroy. Jesus says, beware of their deception. But the good news is that we have an antidote for our deception, for that deception. And that is what Jesus calls, or John calls, the anointing. You know, I'm getting nervous about these umbrellas. Roy, if you don't mind, would you move over there and sit by the umbrella and just hold on to it? Or if it flies up and hits somebody, it could hurt them. So the good news is that we have an antidote for the deception. And this is what John calls the anointing. Verse 27, as for you, the anointing which you receive from him abides in you. And you have no need for anyone to teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about all things, and is true and is not a lie, and just as it has taught you, you abide in him. Now we addressed this anointing last time. But let's make sure we understand what he is talking about. He's not talking about some sort of second spiritual blessing. He's not talking about some sort of secondary spiritual experience which completes what's lacking in our conversion. He's simply speaking of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit which all believers receive upon salvation. All believers in the Lord Jesus Christ possess the fullness of the Holy Spirit as our birthright. In fact, whether or not we possess the Holy Spirit is the determining factor of our, of our salvation. If we have not the Spirit, we are not Christ. Listen to what Paul says in that regard in Romans 8, 9. He says, however, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. So when we are saved, we are given the anointing. You don't have to go out and search for the Holy Spirit. You don't have to seek some sort of second blessing to receive the Holy Spirit. When you are saved, you receive the Holy Spirit. We have the permanent indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And his purpose is to bring the Word of God to life in us. His purpose is to teach us. His purpose is to abide with us. It's not something we need to seek for. It's the Spirit of Christ, who Christ calls the Spirit of Truth. He is the reason that we that are saved can distinguish the truth from the lie. And that's what John's saying here. You have anointing, which is the Holy Spirit, that enables you to be able to discern the truth from the lie. Verse 20. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things. The Holy Spirit is not given to us sporadically so that we can have some spiritual experience. You know, back in the Old Testament, they were given the Holy Spirit sporadically. You read about the Spirit came upon Saul or come upon David or came upon Samson. It was given sporadically. But in the New Testament, in the New Covenant, we are given the Spirit permanently to indwell us. His primary purpose is to teach us and convict us of the truth. He confirms the teaching of the Word of God in us so that we might know the truth, that we might distinguish the truth from the lie, and so that we might abide in Him. Listen, let's make sure we understand it. The Holy Spirit is the author of the Word of God. Holy men of God, Peter said, spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Paul says all scripture is given by the inspiration of God. Inspiration means God breathed, and the word for spirit is pneuma in the Greek, which is air or breath. The Spirit of God breathed life into the words that holy men of God wrote down for us, that we might know the truth, that we might worship God in spirit and in truth. So we can verify teaching through the Word of God and through the anointing of the Holy Spirit which opens our hearts and minds so that we're able to understand the Word of God. We 
We can verify whether or not something is true by the Word of God. And John even says that we're supposed to test the spirits by the Word of God. He says in chapter 4, test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. But we test the spirits, as I said a while ago, by the Word of God, which is true, which is immutable, which is unchanging, which is eternal through the anointing of the Holy Spirit who leads us into the truth. Listen, I didn't put this in my notes, but I meant to perhaps say something about this. That doesn't mean we don't need to be taught. It doesn't mean we don't need to hear preaching. It doesn't mean we can have church all by ourselves and, and we'll be just fine. God has gifted pastors and teachers to present the word, to teach the word, to explain the word. And there is a need for teachers. John isn't saying there isn't a need for teachers, but that, he's, that the Holy Spirit is ultimately our teacher. He teaches us through the Word of God. He's the one that opens our minds to receive it or not and to be able to know the truth. You know, when I first got right with God, I was living out in California, and I got so far away from God, I had never, I, I, I almost doubted His existence. I was a Christian. I'd been saved when I was a kid, but I'd gotten so far away. And, I, and one of my problems was I didn't know the truth anymore. I wasn't sure what to believe anymore. And so when I came to God and I really got right with God, I called out to Him and I said, Lord, I want to know the truth. No matter what the truth is, I want to know it. I don't know if everything I was ever taught about the Bible is true or not. I want to know, though, the truth. Tell me the truth. And you know, the first verse that God revealed to me or showed me as I went up to my room and began to study the Word of God was this verse right here. And you will need no teacher for the Holy Spirit will lead and guide you into all truth. So the Holy Spirit is able to do that. It doesn't mean we don't need preaching. We don't need to be taught. But it means that we need the Holy Spirit to be able to discern truth from error. Now that ministry of the Holy Spirit is what John calls abiding. Abiding is the antidote to prevent the deception. The abiding has two aspects. First of all, notice that the anointing abides in you. Verse 27, as for you, the anointing which you receive from him abides in you. So in other words, the Holy Spirit is not just passing through. He's not just temporary. He is permanently indwelling us to believe. He is the deposit on the promise that God made, which is eternal life. There are a couple of verses that speak of this aspect. The first is first, Second Corinthians 1.22, which says, Who also God, who also sealed us and gave us the Spirit in our hearts as a pledge. A pledge, in this context, means a deposit or a down payment. The other reference is in 2 Corinthians 5.5, 5, which says, Now he who prepared us for this very purpose is God, who gave to us the Spirit as a pledge. Again, a down payment. So in both verses, we see the principle that the Holy Spirit is given to us as a down payment on our eternal life with God. You know, when you buy a house, you usually have to make a down payment. And that serves as a pledge that you're going to follow through and buy that house. You're going to purchase that house. You're in effect making a promise, which is guaranteed by a down payment. And that's what the anointing is that abides in us. It's a down payment by God through the Holy Spirit on the fullness of eternal life, which we will receive at Christ's second coming. Eternal life is guaranteed by the abiding of the Holy Spirit in us. And God doesn't break his promises. So the Spirit is given to us permanently, and He will complete in us what He has begun. But notice John speaks of us abiding as well. Not only does the Spirit abide in us, but we abide in Him. As for you, he says, the anointing which you receive from Him abides in you, and you have no need for anyone to teach you. But as His anointing teaches you about all things, and is true and is not His lie, and just as it has taught you, you abide in Him. That's the important part. Just as it has taught you, you abide in Him. 
So the second part of this verse speaks of our abiding in Him. Now what does that mean? To abide in Him means that we are in fellowship with Him. We obey Him. We walk in the light as He is in the light. We walk in the truth. That's what John means when he says, as His anointing teaches you about all things, just as it has taught you, you abide in Him. So we abide in the Holy Spirit by doing what He teaches us. As He leads us through the Word of God, we obey His teaching, and in that way we abide in Him. You know, it's like the Old Testament proverb in Amos 3.3, 3, which says, how can two walk together unless they be in agreement? We're in agreement with the Holy Spirit. That's how we abide with Him. John said it another way back in chapter 1, verse 6 of our book that we're looking at. He says, if we say that we have fellowship with Him, and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as He Himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. So we have fellowship with God when we walk with God. When we don't walk in sin. That's abiding. That's how we abide in Him, when we walk with Him. We obey His Word. So we have now the promise, the deception, the anointing, the abiding, and now the coming. Verse 28, the coming. Now little children, abide in Him, so that when He appears, we may have confidence and not shrink away from Him in shame at His coming. Now that should be self-explanatory, shouldn't it? If we obey Him, if we walk with Him, if we abide with Him, then we won't be ashamed when He comes again. You know, when I was growing up, as a kid, I think one of the things I dreaded most was hearing my mom say, just you wait until your dad comes home. That usually came as a result of, of a day of fighting with my brothers and sisters and just being a real pest. Whatever it was, I had been disobeying. And when dad came home, my mom was going to tell him all that I'd been doing. And there was going to be consequences. So on those days, I didn't run to the door and throw my arms around my dad because I'm so happy to see him. No, I, I hid in my room. I was afraid to come out. Well, John says Jesus is coming back. He's coming back to claim his bride, his church, to live with him forever. He's also coming back to judge the world and to make all things new. John says the key to not being ashamed when he comes again is to abide with him now. To do what he commands us to do now through his spirit and his word. To walk with him now. That's what it means to walk with the Lord or to be a disciple. It's to follow, to fellowship, to obey, to abide in the truth. And if we abide in him, then we will not be ashamed at his coming. So that brings us to the last point, the last assurance that we are not deceived, that we abide with him. And that last point is the righteousness. Verse 29, if you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone also who practiced righteousness is born of him. So how are we assured? that we are the children of God. This is another test that John's given us. How do we distinguish the children of God? By the fact that they practice righteousness. We know that Jesus Christ is righteous. That should not be even open to debate this morning. But if you, are being, if you have been born again, then you are being remade into His image. In our salvation, we receive His righteousness in exchange for our sins. And we receive His Spirit who is given to lead us into righteousness through the Word of God and through His anointing. The Holy Spirit also gives us the power over sin, that we might have the power to do that which God commands us, us to do. And so consequently, because of this grace which we have received, we practice righteousness. Practice indicates that you haven't perfected it yet. It means that you are perhaps a work in progress. But you have a deposit which will one day be paid in full. That day when Christ returns, our sinful nature will be done away with. And with, we will receive a new body and be joined to our renewed spirit 
which will be rejoined to our new spirit. And we will be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Our righteousness at that point will be perfected. And that righteousness will make it possible for us to have the fullness of life that God promised before the world began. A life that is abundant, a life that is full and everlasting, a life that abides with God forever. If you are here today and you recognize in hearing this message that you have not received the promise of eternal life, that you have not received the anointing and abiding of the Holy Spirit, that you have not received the righteousness which comes through faith in Jesus Christ as your substitute, then I urge you to confess your sin and believe in Jesus Christ for the remission of your sin, confessing him as Lord and Savior, that you might receive the righteousness which comes through faith in him. That's the only way to receive the anointing and to receive the eternal, abundant life that God has promised. As Peter preached on the day of Pentecost, repent and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises for you and your children and all who are far off as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. Let us pray. Father, I pray that if there's anyone here today that has not received the promise of eternal life, that today would be the day of their salvation. That they would turn to you and believe and receive the gift of God, which is eternal life, which is the righteousness of Jesus Christ, which is the anointing of the Holy Spirit, the indwelling of his presence that we might be one with you that we might live forever with you lord i pray no one would walk out of here today without knowing that is the reality in their life we ask these things in jesus name we're going to sing a song in closing it is well with my soul. That's really the, the key, isn't it? Is whether or not our soul is right with God. So I would encourage you this morning to make sure of that. That your soul is right with God. It is well with my soul. Let's sing that together <clears throat> the closing song. Well, it is well.
Thank you for your attention. Have a great day.